We defined radioactivity yesterday as a natural process, a random process, a spontaneous process. What does that mean? Summarize what I just said, a random process, a spontaneous process, a natural process. Sorry? Okay, it's, it's unpredictable to some degree. Now, statistically, um, we can make pretty good predictions about it, actually. But on, on small scales, on individual nuclei, you're right. It's very unpredictable, okay, on small scales. What we mean by that, natural, ra random, spontaneous, we mean by that that we don't control it. We don't make it happen. We don't decide when it happens. We don't decide how often it happens. Nature controls all of that. We have nothing to say about any of it. It is a natural, random, spontaneous process where a nucleus decays. For whatever reason, a nucleus is unstable. We said yesterday that there's about 2,500 different isotopes of elements out there. About 90% of them are radioactive. 90% are unstable for one reason or another. So 90% of them will eventually decay into something else. The resulting radiation, we said, is ionizing. Ionizing radiation just means that it creates ions. It turns atoms into ions. What's an ion? What's an ion? It's an atom with a... Yeah, it's a charged atom, exactly. And those aren't, uh, in a lot of cases, aren't very good because charged atoms or ions can create chemical reactions that aren't supposed to happen. And if that happens inside our body, then those chemical reactions that aren't supposed to happen lead to biological things that aren't supposed to happen. And biological things that aren't supposed to happen leads to all kinds of things. Okay? It can be radiation sickness. Okay? It can be cataracts in your eyes. It can be reproductive disorders, reproductive issues. Um, it creates genetic mutations because of damage to sex cells. Uh, it can create cancer in extreme cases. It can create, create death in, like, in short order in some cases due to extreme radiation poisoning. Ionizing radiation is, is produced as a result of radioactive decay. We also get ionizing radiation, different type, okay, different type with x-rays, let's say, by rapidly decelerating electrons. They have the same effect, different radiations, but they have the same effect, and that is to turn atoms into ions. Now, this is where we finished off yesterday with this big table of the three or four, depending upon how you classify them, types of radioactivity. An alpha particle, an alpha particle we said was emitted when we had big nuclei that were unstable. Okay, that big nucleus tried to become stable by breaking off a chunk of it. So let's say you get uranium-238, it's not stable, it breaks off a little chunk in an attempt to become more stable. That little chunk called an alpha particle also has a symbol of 4,2-He. Because chemically, a helium nucleus is identical to an alpha particle. It's exactly the same thing, indistinguishable from one another. How many protons, by the way, does an alpha particle or helium nucleus have? Two. Yeah, how many neutrons? Two. Four minus two is two. Is it matter or energy? It's matter. Matter is... Anything that has mass, protons and neutrons have mass, this is going to be matter. All right, beta negative decay. Well, this works differently. You're not exactly breaking a chunk off in an attempt to get, become more stable, but you are releasing something from the nucleus still to make it more stable. That thing that you release is a beta particle. That's the symbol for a beta particle. The other symbol for a beta particle might be 0 minus 1, E, little e. Why do we say 0 minus 1 e? What is a beta particle? Yeah, yeah, it's an electron. If it's an electron, then a beta, a beta particle is matter or energy. It's matter. Okay, what about beta plus or beta positive? The symbol for beta positive is 0 plus 1 beta also known as 0 plus 1 e, yeah, 0 plus 1 e, not p, because p is a symbol for a proton. E is a symbol for an electron. This isn't exactly an electron. This would be a, a positron, right? 
Is this matter or energy? Trick question. It's antimatter. Yeah, there's the trick in it, right? Is that it's not matter or energy, it's antimatter. Antimatter is exactly the same thing as matter in almost every respect. There's always one exception. There's always one thing that makes antimatter different, one property. And in this case, it would be charge. So a positron is exactly the same in every regard to an electron, except its charge is opposite to that. It has the mass of an electron. It has all the same spin properties as an electron. It's just positively charged. That's all. And it's antimatter. And when matter and antimatter come together, they annihilate each other and end up producing energy. So matter, gone. Antimatter, gone. They destroy each other. They annihilate each other and produce pure energy. Finally, the last one we had was uh, gamma decay, gamma particles. Gamma particle looks like this. How many protons would be in a gamma ray? Zero. How many neutrons? How many electrons? Zero. How many uh, positrons? Is this matter or energy? It's energy. It's electromagnetic radiation. If you remember back in last unit, day one of your last unit, we said radio waves are produced by oscillating charge. Visible light was produced by transitions of electrons in the atom. X-rays are produced by rapidly decelerating electrons. Gamma rays are produced by nuclear decay, radioactive decay, matter being converted to energy. All right. Let's fill in this next column that we started filling in yesterday. We don't need to know a lot of detail about the cause of each of these types of ionizing radiation, but we do need to know a little bit of it. We're going to say that alpha particles of these helium nuclei break off of other nuclei, bigger nuclei, when the nucleus is unstable because it has too many protons. Big nuclei sometimes, not always, big nuclei sometimes have too many protons relative to the number of neutrons. Why is that a problem? Well, because the protons repel each other, and they create a repulsive electrostatic force. If that electrostatic force is too big, then the nucleus is going to be pushed apart. All the pieces are going to be pushed apart from one another. But the good news is that there is another force called the strong nuclear force, an attractive force that attempts to balance things out. If the strong nuclear force that acts between protons and neutrons and everything inside the nucleus wins out over the electric force, then the nucleus is stable. But if the electric force wins out, then the nucleus is unstable. So we're going to say when we have too many protons, we have more chance of the repulsive force winning and therefore the nucleus being unstable. If that's the cause of the instability, then we will get an alpha particle ejected, an alpha particle breaking off of the nucleus. A couple protons, a couple neutrons gone in an attempt to improve the balance of protons and neutrons. Now, that's one cause of radioactivity, the cause of alpha decay. Beta negative decay occurs for a different reason. Here we have too many neutrons. This is not a force problem. This is an energy problem. The energy isn't right. We talked yesterday a little bit about the nucleus club. Who's in the nucleus club? Neutrons and protons. Yeah, neutrons and protons. The nucleus club gets together and says, something's not quite right here. The, the energy isn't quite right. The vibe of the, the nucleus club isn't quite right. So we've got to do something about that. We've got to change the energy around. How do we change the energy around? Somebody has a bright idea of changing a neutron into something. We don't want to get rid of a neutron because they're part of the club. So we change one instead. Too many neutrons? Change one. Change one into a proton. But there's a problem with that because if we just look at that, a neutron changing into a proton, it violates a, a, an important law. What law is that? Conservation of charge, good. So what happens? It's not just a proton produced here. A neutron changes into a proton and an electron. The electron gets kicked out of the nucleus club because electrons don't belong. So we now have one less neutron, one more proton. The energy is better now. We're more comfortable with this. 
This electron that was released is the beta particle, the electron that comes from the nucleus, where there weren't any electrons in the nucleus. How did we get one from the nucleus? We made one. We changed a neutron into a proton and an electron. Beta positive? Well, that occurs when you have too many protons again. But again, it's not a force thing like alpha decay was. The problem is somewhat the same. You have too many protons, but that doesn't result in too much repulsive force. It results in, again, an energy unbalance. The nucleus cup gets together and says, we have too many protons. Something's not quite right here. Let's change a proton. What are we going to change it into? A neutron. But that doesn't work because it violates the conservation of charge, right? So what else is produced in addition to the neutron? A positron, E plus. Well, that positron isn't welcome in the nucleus, so it gets kicked out. That's your beta positive particle. And finally, gamma decay is just a byproduct. A byproduct of something that's already happened. Alpha decay has occurred. The nucleus is left in an excited state. Beta decay has occurred. The nucleus is left in an excited state. But it doesn't want to stay there. It wants to be the Eeyore nucleus. It's just a hum -ho. So it gives off energy to get it back down to its normal, regular Eeyore state. And the energy that it gives off is gamma ray photons. So alpha decay has occurred. Beta decay has occurred. The nucleus is excited, but it goes back down to its normal state by giving off a gamma ray. So gamma decay doesn't happen on its own. Alpha and beta, I would say, are a little more fundamental. They happen because of instability. Gamma happens not because of instability so much, but because something else has already happened, leaving the nucleus excited. Now let's fill in these last two columns here. Let's fill in the last column first. The ionizing power, the ability of these, uh, of these uh, ionizing radiations to turn atoms into ions, which, as you remember, isn't, isn't usually a positive thing. We turn atoms into ions, it creates chemical reactions that aren't supposed to happen, biological things that aren't supposed to happen, results in all kinds of bad things. The bad news is alpha particles have a very high ionizing power. Very high. They will turn atoms into ions easily. Gamma rays, I don't want to say they have a low ionizing power, but of the three, they have the lowest ionizing power. And the fence sitters, beta particles, they're the fence sitters. They can't decide what they want to be, so they have a medium in between alpha particles and gamma rays. Alpha particles have a very, very high ability to ionize matter. On the flip side, though, they have, because of their size and mass, which is relative to beta particles and gamma rays, pretty big. Right? We're not suggesting that, that alpha particles are big, but relative to beta and gamma, they're pretty big and heavy. Because of their relative size and mass, they have a, a pretty low ability to penetrate matter. So low, in fact, that if somebody was to get really upset with me, bring their alpha particle gun in, and decide to zap me with their alpha particle gun, I would look at them in the face and say, bring it on. And then I would hold up my alpha particle shield, which is a couple of sheets of paper. Alpha particles can be stopped literally by a couple of sheets of paper. 
That's how low of penetrating ability they have. Okay, the flip side to that is that if they get in, they do a lot of damage. But they're not going to penetrate the tissue, the outer tissue in your body, because a piece of paper or two stops it. Gamma rays, on the other hand, well, they have the lowest ability to ionize matter, but they have a very, very high ability to penetrate matter. In fact, they'll penetrate several centimeters of lead. You gotta have several centimeters of concrete or lead in order to stop gamma rays. The bad news is they penetrate matter easily. They'll go straight through your body easily. The good news is they have a lot less ability to ionize atoms than, than alpha particles. So it's kind of like nature's way of, of balancing things out in a sense. Right? Alpha particles, they do a lot of damage, but they have a tough time getting inside your body. Gamma rays, they don't do nearly as much damage, but they have a much, much easier time getting inside your body. And once again, those fence sitters, the beta particles, well, their ability to ionize matter is somewhere in between, or to uh, penetrate matter, I should say, is, uh, oh, sorry, to ionize matter. Which column am I on here? The penetrating power is somewhere in between. So if we rank them in terms of their ability to ionize matter, we would say alpha is number one, beta two, gamma three. In terms of their ability to penetrate matter, we would say gamma is one, beta is two, and alpha is three, the lowest. Listen, your exposure to radioactivity is not usually so much an issue with the particles, per se, alpha particles are produced by this radioactive sample over there in the corner of the room. So what? They can't penetrate my body. They're not going to do any damage, right, other than if I'm in close proximity, maybe burn me. But they're not going to get into my body and cause serious damage, right? The problem more often arises not so much from the alpha particles entering my body or the beta particles entering my body, the problem more often arises from you consuming the radioactive material. Not the alpha particles and the beta particles, but the radioactive material. So let's say there's been some kind of radiological disaster that contaminates the water and the soil. You eat vegetables that were grown with contaminated water and contaminated soil. These vegetables now contain radioactive, uh, radioactive isotopes. Now you're eating them. Now you have radioactive isotopes in your body, which decay once they're in your body. That's a problem. Does that make sense? You don't usually have to worry about the alpha particles over there in the corner. You have to worry about consuming whatever's producing the alpha particles over there in the corner.